try not to tell her too much because then she doesn't want to be here. And she's like, I've already heard this. I'm bored. Um, Maury, can you turn that down just a little bit? It's the third one in. Check, check, check. Does that sound all right? Everybody hear me? Hi, Mary. I forgot your name. David. How are you, David? Glad to see you here. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers. Right? Give yourself a round of applause if you're a mother. You're a mother. I did. Oh, okay. I didn't see you. <laughs> oh, okay. Praise the Lord. Well, I have a, um, a message. It's kind of sort of piggyback, I think, off last week. And how many people went out of here getting their praise on after last week? Amen. Amen? And the, getting your victory going and understanding and realizing who you are in God. And I love the songs we were singing today, I Am a Child of God. I mean, really, just a good reminder of, of who and what we are. But knowing that you know, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and so he doesn't change, he's, he's the same. And our, our, search, 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 our situations and circumstances, that's a, that's a situation and a circumstance all in one, if I could figure out how to say that, change all the time, right? That's why we have this thing called life. We're alive, we're living, we're in this world, we're in this natural place. And we're continually having to adapt to life's trials, life's victories, um, Life's up and downs, I guess, for lack of better words. And I just really have been encouraging myself, I should say the Holy Spirit has been encouraging me um, to really just dig in to praise Him in the ups and the downs. To get my praise on when things look bleak and to get my praise on when things look good. Um, the message that I've got today is, and the backside of that, is just a reminder for us as a church body, as believers, as moms, that God's got this. Amen? Don't, don't hit it yet. Don't hit it yet. I even have a little jingle that I made um, so that you will not forget the, the title. Should, should we play it now? Should we play the little jingle? Should I embarrass myself now? Why not? So you, you will not forget the title of this message. God's got this. You say it with me. God's got this. Ready? I think it's ready just to hit play. God's got this. God's got this. God's got this. My, my, my. Break it down. Stop. Father time. All right, we'll have to play that again at the end just to remind you. Ready? So... Uh, How's it go? God's got this. Amen? How many people know that God's got it even when it looks bad? God's got this. And he doesn't change. So after last week hearing about Paul and Silas, God showed me something else in that message that I didn't see last week, or I guess I didn't share, was it said that they and a few others were on their way to prayer. Right? They were on their way to prayer. And they get arrested because of what they did, casting out the devil. They get put into prison, into the inner prison, shackled to a wall. And at the midnight hour, what were they found doing? Praising, Praising God and praying. If I got arrested for something today in this culture, and I was on my way to church here for a prayer meeting, because we formalize everything, don't we? Like we set apart like a, a worship time or a, a prayer and harp and bowl service where we're going to pray and we're going we're gonna to worship and we're coming. It's going to be 7 o'clock. And, and even though we're going to let the Spirit move, like we're going to be free, right? We're really going to exercise our, our liberty in Christ and we're going to let the Spirit move, but we still all know that we want out of here about 8, 8.30, right? We're, so we, we have this set time from 7 to 8, 7 to 8.30 for prayer and worship. We've made our, our mind up and we are going. It's a Wednesday. We're, we're going home and eating quick because some of you live a little ways away and you're coming back to church, but you have it set because after all, we have kids, we have families. We have to get to bed at a reasonable hour because we got things that we have to do. If I was locked up that night on my way to prayer, I'm not sure that at midnight I'd be praising God. See, Paul and Silas, they were on their way to prayer. And they were going to have prayer regardless of whatever happened to them. They were going to have prayer and they were going to worship. It doesn't matter what happened to them. Whether they got beat up that day. Paul said it. 
I've been shipwrecked three times, beat probably unrecognizable, unconscious. I mean, look, we could read it, all the things that he went through, and I bet you it still didn't stop him from having his prayer meeting. Very religious folk, I would call it more dedicated and, and committed to the Lord. But we all probably can admit that if we got arrested or even pulled over to get a ticket because I was speeding to prayer because I was running late, I might use that as an excuse to get ice cream and go back home. I mean, I'm, right, I mean, I'm going to be late now. So I, yeah, let's just go to Dave's or whatever it is, ice cream, and get an ice cream and go home, honey, because we don't want to walk in late. I mean, but not these guys, man. They were dedicated. Turn with me, if you would, to Matthew 7. We're going to look at uh, God's got this. I'm going to look a little bit at trust. We talked last week about, um, and this week already, about God not changing. He's the same. And they were praising him for who he was. Even though their situation had changed, even though their surroundings had changed, even though they found themselves shackled and immovable and they couldn't get out, they were going to praise God anyway because they knew that God's got this. They knew that every minute of the day and every hour was father time. Amen. And if the father is for us, Come on, guys. If Christ be for us, who can be against us? And we need to just be reminded, I'm going to just remind us today that Christ is for us. I want to remind you mothers today. Listen, some of you have been laboring in prayers for years for your children, um, your families, believing God. You know, I know you have teenagers and you know you've, you've sowed into their lives, but they might be in a little wild season, right? And so you're believing. And today, if you get anything out of this, is to know to not quit. God's got this. It's Father time. Amen. And I want to look at a couple of stories and to remind us of how good God is and how faithful he is to us. But this first story is going to be about Jesus, and he's ministering to, to all of us about trusting God um, with our worries and trusting God not about what we're going to wear and what we're going to eat. So let's take a look at this. In Matthew 7, verse 7, it says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. Isn't it fascinating that when we read that verse, just that, that verse alone, Matthew 7, 7, it doesn't say ask, and it will be given to you if. It doesn't say seek, and you will find if you do this. It doesn't say knock, and it will be opened to you if you re- meet all these requirements. Does it? He just says, Seek, ask, and knock. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. What man, that probably is church mice. They get get into the wires and stuff. Don't worry about it. What man is there among you who if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? I'm going to turn this around. What woman, what mother, what mom, it's Mother's Day, right? What mom among you, if your son or daughter asks for bread, will you give them a stone? You know, Ray, when your kids come out at like at noon or whatever, whatever time you have set apart for like for lunch, whatever lunch time is for your kids, I bet you they come out, man. I bet you there's times where they've sat down at the table and they're like ready to go. Like you, you, maybe you didn't even announce lunch was even coming yet and they're hungry and they don't, they're not asking you like, are we going to eat today? Right? Do kids ask that? No. Kids know that mom and dad are going to feed them. Kids know that they're going to have clothing. They're not worried about the roof over their head or the the shelter or the heat or the the electric bill or the gas. See, they're in an age, they're in a time in their life when they're being cared for. And then as we get older, and we call it, we get more mature, we reach a point in our life where we become the caregiver, right? And I, I was thinking about this this morning. Uh, this is something I shared with you, a, pre, a little taste. But going from being the one that's cared for to the caregiver, that adds more stress, doesn't it? So all, all the while as we get older and we call it more mature, and we're not, you would think that with more maturity, I would have less worry or less stress. 
But I find that in my own walk, as I grew older, and now I have the responsibility of a wife and kids or a family, that all these worries and anxieties and fears that I did not have as a child when I was being cared for have now come upon me as a caregiver. And I see now that I am the guy who has to provide, ultimately God, but I got to get off my butt and work. I got to earn some money. I got to provide so she can pay some bills. I got to make sure that there's food on the table. Meanwhile, I've transitioned from being cared for to being the caregiver. Now, our whole life, it's kind of the irony of life. We have to be cared for when we're young. And then when we get old, we leave this world being cared for. Right? And how you get cared for is, is going to either happen in two ways. How well you served in the middle, and you <laughs> raised your kids up, and you, and you treated them well, so that when we're old, you're going to take really good care, right? <laughs> That's too mushy for her, uh-uh. Or you make a ton of money, and you're going to pay someone to care for you. But the irony of life is we're being cared for in the beginning, we're being cared for at the end. But I'm finding that in this state of life where we're supposed to be more mature, we're supposed to have it all together, we actually find ourselves probably striving a little harder and, and fighting a little harder. And we, when we're, I'm reminded of fight the good fight of faith. It's kind of interesting that the scriptures teach us that. Because as we get older and more mature and become the caregiver, we don't have that childlike faith anymore starts to diminish. And our battle is to hold on to that childlike faith through our life, right? Fight the good fight of faith, unless you become like little children. What was Jesus saying? They didn't have a care in the world. They know daddy's got this. It's father time, right? Daddy's got this. God's got this. So as we get older, and we're fighting this good fight of faith, and we're trying to hold on. You know, most children, I'm going to say this boldly, and hopefully it doesn't apply to anyone in here, but I would say to probably all of our kids in here, don't worry about their food, they don't worry about their clothing, because even when we were in a poor state, even when we didn't have jobs, even when we weren't doing well, we knew how to still go to the clothing stores or the, where they're handing out food. We knew how to get the stuff that we needed to take care of the children. And the children just played in the corner like they always did. And they didn't know that we were worried, scared, and didn't know how we were going to pay the rent. They didn't know. What verse were we in, gang? Verse 9, Or what man is there, or what woman, what mom, if your son or daughter asks for bread, would give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will you give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, thank you, Lord, know how to give good gifts to your children, then how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? You know, and as we read that, it, it didn't say requirements. It didn't say to fulfill certain obligations. He's our Father. He's our Father. And as you moms sit here today and dads and you think about your, your children, you love them, right? You hear them in there having a blast. We love our children. We're going to provide for them. We're going to take care of them. We're going to protect them. If someone comes to hurt them, we're going we're gonna to guard them, right? Well, do you think our Heavenly Father is, is the same? Do you think that he, he broods over us like a hen over her chicks? He's watching over us. He's got our back. His glory goes before us. He's feeding us. He's clothing us. He's taking care of us. And somewhere in our, as we get older into this adult life, we begin to, to lose our focus and we, our faith begins to be challenged by life's situations and trials. And we find ourselves in a place where we start questioning God. And we find, our, you know, I, I, I hate this point in my life when I would be begging God for more things than I was believing God for. Anybody ever been there? Oh God, woe is me. Poor us. You know, and, and, and I'm having a lack of, I'm having an identity crisis is what I'm having. I have forgotten who I am. I have forgotten who is my father. I have forgotten what kingdom I was birthed into. And we need to be reminded to be like dear children who they don't worry. Children do not worry about where their food or their drink is going to come. But they're in a position of innocence and they're believing. Hallelujah. Turn with me if you would over to Luke. Eight. Matthew 
Matthew, Luke 8. I just wanted to stir us up a little bit and remind us about how good God is and that God's got this. And we need to praise him all the time. But I wanted to take that, that trust, that faith, and that believing in God to just a, a little bit different perspective by looking at this story here. Excuse me. And this story here is about the woman with the issue of blood. Make sure I got the right place. I do. So let's go ahead and dig right in. In verse 40. So it was when Jesus returned that the multitude welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue. And he fell down at Jesus' feet, and he begged him to come to his house. For he had only, or excuse me, for he had an only daughter about 12 years of age, and she was dying. But as he went, the multitudes thronged him. Now a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years, who had spent all of her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any, came from behind and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her flow of blood stopped. And Jesus said, Who touched me? And when he didn't, and excuse me, when all denied it, Peter and those who were with him said, Master, the multitudes throng you, and they press into you, and you say, Who has touched me? And Jesus says, Somebody touched me, for I have perceived that power has gone out from me. Now when the woman saw that she was, was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down at his feet. She declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And Jesus said to her, Daughter, be of good cheer, for your faith has made you well. Go in peace. You know, sometimes in life, as we continue to go through our every day, we trust God, right? We know that God's going to take care of us. But we see this woman now in Scripture who knows that God is taking care of her. I'm sure that she was a child of God, an Israelite woman, I imagine. I'd, I'd have to read and check into that. But she's believing God for, what, 12 years? And she needs a healing. She has an issue of blood that she, it won't be healed. It won't stop flowing. She's called unclean. Not allowed to probably even be in this public place. Not allowed to even be in this crowd. And here she hears one day, she hears a ruckus. She hears a sound of one coming through. As she has waited 12 years and has exhausted all of her money, all of her savings has been sent spent on physicians to try to be healed and she has lost all her money now. She has nothing saved up. I, I can only imagine that all of her hope is dwindling quickly. I mean, but this woman sees and hears of Jesus coming through the crowd. And Jesus is on his way. He's just passing by, guys. He's going to this other dude's house. He's going to heal his only daughter. He's decided to go along and it says that there was a great crowd and all of this crowd is thronging Jesus. They're all touching him. What's the difference between her and them that day? How come all of the crowd that was thronging him and pressing into him, how come they weren't healed or delivered or saved or set free? The story doesn't tell us about any of them. But there's one who not being clean, who being an outcast of society, who shouldn't even be at this place at all, comes pushing through the crowd and she has set her face on Jesus and she knows in the heart of her heart that if I can just get a hold of his garment, I don't need to talk to him, I don't need to beg him, I don't need him to look at me, I don't even need to ask him, I don't even need him to answer me. All I need is a piece, just a touch of God. I just need to get a, just a hold of the edge of his garment. Sometimes, guys, it doesn't matter what names people have put on you. Sometimes it doesn't matter what people are calling you or telling you you won't accomplish or what you can't achieve. Sometimes, how do you, do you guys know that sometimes you got to push even people out of your way to reach your destiny? Sometimes you got to push your way through the crowds and through the noise and you got to get all that stuff in life that's been warring against you, that's been coming in trying to steal your childlike faith, all that stuff that's been trying to, to cause you to, to not live again as you, when you were being cared for and now you're the caregiver. Well, here's a woman who's a caregiver, but she's no good to nobody in this condition. And she knew that I had to push my way through to get my healing. Nothing's going to stop me this day. Because this might be the only opportunity I have to just get a taste, a touch of the King of Glory. Could you imagine? I mean, can, I can hardly imagine, man, just being in Batavia. Let's say we're at a festival, whatever we're at, and literally Jesus is passing by. 
Man, I'd push through too, and I'd, I'm not even sick, man. I just would push through because I'd be like, I got I to gotta get a hold of Jesus. You know, I want to see him, but I'd be different. I'd be like, Jesus, <laughs> hey, how are you? The naysayers are going to be in your life. And they come with many forms. It's not just people. Opposition comes in all kinds of forms. You know, when your kids are in rebellion and, and you've been praying and believing God and taking them to church their whole life, when things don't seem to be panning out the way that you thought it would, these are all, all, all the demons love to just attach themselves to all of your situations and, and life situations. And, and all of a sudden you start hearing these little whispers in your ear I told you it wasn't going to work out the way you thought it was. I told you you were a failure. I told you you were no good. Daddy don't love you. You're different. If God really cared for you, your kids wouldn't be running amok. Voices go on and on and on. How many voices do you think she heard? I guarantee you, I guarantee you being human, as human as I am, as human as you are, I guarantee you there had to be the voices and the thoughts of her thinking in herself and reasoning and saying to herself, this is my life now. Twelve years with an issue of blood that wouldn't stop. She had to at least entertain the thought that this is just who I am now. I have spent all of my money with no hope, no healing, no one can help me. I'm hopeless and I'm helpless. But there was a drive in this world. There was a no quit in this woman. You know, maybe those thoughts came. Maybe she entertained them even once or twice. Maybe she repented and said, God, forgive me for not trusting you and believing in the God of miracles. I mean, this is, this is a woman who all her life was raised listening to the stories of how God separated the, 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 the sea so they could pass on dry ground. This is a woman who literally was told by her grandfathers and grandmothers how awesome and amazing God was. Not just us hearing it out of a book. People that experienced God firsthand. Those who were literally waiting for the Messiah to come. And she or she finds herself discouraged with this. But something said, don't quit. You ever heard that, that, that acronym or whatever it's called? Push, pray until something happens. The old timers used to say that. Pray until something happens. Pray until God moves. Believe God. Don't quit. Don't stop. Your moment of healing, your, your, that moment of time where you're going to reach out with, and touch destiny is just a stretch away. And if I could encourage even you, anyone that's here today, don't quit being a mom, don't quit being a grandmom, don't quit being a dad, don't quit being a believer, don't quit being a brother or a sister, don't stop praying, don't stop believing, keep pressing on, push through that crowd, push through the noise, separate it all, and do all that you can to get a hold of even just the, the hem of Jesus' garment. Because your destiny, your breakthrough, your miracle is just a stretch away. And if you quit now, you won't reach it. You won't get a hold of it. You may not ever have it. This woman said, I've got to do all that I can to push my way through this crowd. I don't care if they call me unclean. I don't care if they say I can't be here. I don't care what they're calling me anymore. I see the Lord of glory passing through this city, and I'm not going to let him pass me by. I have to stir myself up to get a hold of him. And I ask you today, are we going to let God pass us by in our moment of visitation? You know, God is coming. God is constantly moving. The river of God is always flowing. And I'm a firm believer that it's probably us that's stopping us and holding ourselves back from getting that. But God will hold us back for seasons. There may be things that we want that we're not ready for. Right? And he knows that. So he'll make you wait. He'll make you get hungry. He'll make you desperate. It doesn't matter what they say or what they think whether you're drug addicted, whether you're recovering, whether you're a low life or you're a high life, whether you're clean or unclean, when your situation gets desperate enough, you will get determined. You can't be a child of God and quit. You know, when they, they ask all these Christians over in the Middle East or wherever, the terrorists are, and, and, and they tell them, they ask them, they tell them, you've got to denounce Christ, renounce Christ. Or we're going to take your head. 
If you have a fake walk with God, you could renounce Christ. If you have a religious form, like you go to church on Sunday, but that's all you do, like you don't know Him, you could renounce Christ. But when you've met Jesus, and you have been born again, and the old is washed away, and all look, behold, all has become new. You're that new creature in Christ Jesus. You're born again, spirit-filled, alive from the inside, working its way out. They're asking you to basically deny truth. How can you deny the truth? You can't deny the truth. You're probably going to have to lose your head. <laughs> How can you deny Christ? But when your situation is desperate enough, you will get determined. When you're a child of God, I don't believe quits in us because the Spirit will always continue to nudge you. The Spirit will always continue to stir you up. The preacher will always hopefully try to encourage you. The brothers and sisters will always pray for you and lift you up and encourage you and say, hey, don't quit. And there's something on the inside of you working from the belly on its way out that's telling you on the inside, I don't care how backslidden I was and Jesus' voice was about this big, it was still on the inside of me saying, I am who I am. He was there. I could not deny the, re the existence of God in my heart even when I was living totally contrary to, the, to His will. Don't quit. Be determined. And I was thinking about great story. However we preach it, you know, you can preach it a few different ways. I've heard it preached a few different ways. And I thought, man, that's kind of selfish, right? You start thinking, you look at this woman, she selfishly dug her way through this crowd to get healed. And I got to thinking, though, you need to be like her. We need to be like her. Because we're no good to anyone else if we're going to be in sickness all the time. We're no good to anyone else if we're going to stay a drug addict or an alcoholic all the time. See, because then I have no testimony to share with that next addict. I have no story to share with that next alcoholic. So which means I have no hope to share with that person. Is this making sense? So this woman who was healed of an issue of blood after 12 years of exhausting everything she had, all hope was lost and she got a hold of Jesus. Think of the story that still speaks today. We're preaching it now. We're preaching a story of hope and healing. And it's like without that, she would have had nothing. Think about the air on an airplane. Oxygen. And what do they tell you when you get on the airplane? They're up there doing their spiel. If the air in an airplane gets low, these things are going to drop out of the ceiling and, you know, whatever, these masks. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, don't they tell the mother to put it on first? Yeah. You first. Leave your kid. Leave your child. There's no air, but leave your child. Come on, moms. This, this, is, this, this got to go against the very fibers of who moms are. Right? You want me to suck air first and my kid's going to suffocate. You, you, what, wait, let's back up. Let's, let's do that again. Can we do that again? I'm not, maybe I'm not hearing you right. Yep. But if you don't get the air first, you're no good to your children. Dead. They know that. <laughs> At first we're like, no, 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 no. This doesn't make sense. But we're no good dead. Your child is not going to know how to put that on after you're passed out. You're not going to have a testimony without the test. You're not going to have any hope unless you were hopeless. You're not going to have any victory unless you went through some defeat. It's just the kingdom. <sighs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. I think we should drop that beat again, DJ. <laughs> drop that funky beat. God's got this. God's got this. God's got this. My, my, my. Break it down. Stop. Father time. What was the message about today? God's got this. You're not going to forget that God's got this. And when you know that God's got this, and you know that you're in a fight to hold on to your faith, and you are the caregiver now, but we need to approach God now like we were as little children. You know, we, we complicate it. We were just talking, we were talking about worship or something earlier, and we make things so complicated. God's going to feed us. He's going to clothe us. 
He's going to, we were talking about how many jobs Michelle's had since we moved here. Some she left, some left her. Um, but um, at any rate, God provided one job after another. And you know what was funny as we were driving home last night? We were looking at where God provided jobs around where I was working. We had one car. They were always seemed to be, you know, where they needed to be so that we could use one car or the times or the hours. He, I said, man, he was, had a hard time keeping her employed, you know, but <laughs> they were a tough case. Only because we're trying to work around one job that I was at. But he's got this. He's taking care. And if we can get that in our spirit to know that God is watching over us, that he, we don't have to beg him for a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. That you can run up to the table and say, sit down at the noon hour and say, I'm ready to eat, Lord. Ready to eat, Father. Right? Kids know, man, I'm going to get fed. They don't ask. They might ask what we're having. They, we might whine about what we got to eat, but we're still going to eat. Amen. Now, I'm going to close with, with this. And, and I know that I got seven points. Don't you hate when the preacher preaches a message for 30 minutes and then says, now I got seven points I want to share? Because in the church I used to go, do that meant another hour. But that's not going to happen here. I'm going to brush right through these, and you probably won't even have time to write them down. But it's called Seven Daily Steps to Trust in the Lord with All of Your Heart. Just a little something I found online, so I'm just going to kind of brush through it. And I promise you, six minutes, five minutes. Number one, I don't even understand what this means. It says don't depend on you. Okay, don't depend on you. We live in a world where trust must be earned and seems to be in short supply. But Solomon, the, the famous king who wrote Proverbs, knew that trust is exactly where we must start. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Proverbs 3.5 Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom of the knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond finding out. That's Romans 11. Number two, see we're already on number two. Cry out to God. In all of your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Proverbs 3, I can't see this thing, just bear with me. <laughs> Evening and morning and noon, I cry out in distress and he hears my voice. Number three, run from evil. So much of the world can clutter up our relationship with God. John, the writer of the fourth gospel, describes them as the desires of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of, of lives. In other words, our blessings can easily become our stumbling blocks, and when we think of them as what we deserve or what we need to be happy, when we think of them that way. Instead, life works best when we remember the true source of our blessings, God, and the focus of the, on the things that please him. Do not be wise in your own eyes, but fear the Lord and shun evil. Amen? Number four, put God first in your life. It says, honor the Lord with all of your wealth, with the first fruits of your crops, and you and your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will, will be to the brim with new wine. If we can trust God with the first of our wealth, we're truly showing how much we depend on him. Handling over the first part of our paycheck takes a huge amount of faith after all, but doing it means God is, comes first. Number five, check yourself by God's word. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Jeremiah 17, 9. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke. Proverbs 3, 11. It, if we're ever going to truly trust in God and flee evil, we have to know exactly where we stand. We have to be, or excuse me, have to find an objective measure that tells us the truth. And that truth comes from God and his word. Number six, listen to the Holy Spirit. The Counselor, the Holy Spirit, when the, when, when whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything that I have said to you, John 14, 26. Hallelujah. As we go through our daily, our day, this same Holy Spirit guides us too. This means we don't have to get do it alone and we hope that we are getting it right. No, the Holy Spirit leads us into all truth and protects us. Hallelujah. And number seven, rest in God's love. When we face a difficult world each day, we can sometimes wonder if God even cares. Why do bad things happen? Where is God when I need him? Solomon reminds us that God never takes a break nor leaves us to fend for ourselves. In Proverbs 3.12, he says, because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. Even in the midst of turmoil, God sticks with us and uses those challenges to shape us. When we understand that our perspective, or when we understand that, our perspective is complete. No longer do we see our setbacks as failures. We see them as moments when God or our loving Father works on us. Amen? So seven quick steps. 
Trust God. Believe God. God's got this. That's the message today. We praise our way through into victory. We praise Him when things are going bad. We trust Him through the good and the bad. And we believe that He's for us and not against us. Amen? Know who's on the inside of us. And don't quit. Don't give up. Press through all of life's trials, all of life's circumstances, all of the things that are beating you down. You know, I think of Mary, I think of your job, things that it's a good job, but I know that gets a little frustrating. These things we press through every day, we have to press through things. You know, we all have them. But breakthrough and victory is just a stretch away. Just a stretch away. What is what is God preparing us for? What is He taking you know, what door is He getting us ready to walk through? Amen. Everything is a learning experience, good or bad. So we're going to praise Him all the way. Amen. So God bless you mothers on Mother's Day. I hope that was short enough, seven points in four minutes. I know, I, I really, I really, when we be in church, man, and some of us went to the same church, it's like, okay, 20 minutes of preaching, then we got, I've got seven points, and I'm like, no, I'm going to be here until three. You know, <laughs> you all know. You all been there, huh? One of the three. Praise the Lord. Father, we praise you. We thank you. We thank you for this day. The sun was shining, at least when we got in here. I hope it still is. Lord, but the sun is always shining behind the clouds. So, Father, we know that you're always at work in our lives. We trust you, God. We believe in you, Lord. We know that you are for us and that you're not against us. Father, we know that you take care of us as your dear children, Lord. Our needs are met. We worry not, Father. And we just move into the, to the paths and through the doors that you open. And, and, and we're going to take each illumined step as you lay it out before us. And so, Father, just help us in our our doubts help us in our anxieties and our fears and our worries. I pray, Lord, that you would cause all of that to be pushed aside. Help us to push all that aside, God, so that faith would rise and that we would move forward, God, towards you knowing that you are the author and the finisher of our faith. Father, we praise you in Jesus' name. Bless all these folks as they go. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you guys. Can hold.